All right. Welcome, everybody. Um, thanks, for all, thanks for coming. Um, you know, this first academic event where people were an hour early, so thank you, Army War College. Um, that never happens. <laughs> um, yeah, academic time is a little bit different. So um, my name is Jason Dempsey, and I'm pleased to welcome you on behalf of the Center for Veteran Transition Integration and the Lee Center for Global Journalism, uh, which is graciously co-hosting today's discussion. Uh, today, as I mentioned, we have pleased to have a cohort from the Army War College here in attendance and at Civil Military Relations Center, run by the great Kerry Lee. Um, you know, we also have representatives from the New Pluralist Coalition. We've got reps from We the Vets who crashed the party. We've got um, more in common, uh, you know, a lot of great veterans groups here, uh, as well as a lot of aspiring veteran writers, accomplished writers and aspiring journalists from across New York City. So we're really happy to uh, be kicking off this discussion. You know, the mission of the Center for Veteran Transition Integration is to help veterans as they journey out of uniform, you know, through academia and back into meaningful careers in civilian life. And so um, this is part of that mission because informed, nuanced discussions about how we think about veterans, how we think about war, how we talk about the experience, uh, you know, the effects of how society both approaches the military and consequently how it uses the military and its foreign policy. Uh, for all of us to have a better understanding of that is a really key piece of bridging the divide between America and its military. Uh, so to that end, I can't think of a better panel uh, to have as part of this discussion. With me is Azmat Khan, director of Lee Center here at Columbia, co-host of today's event. Um, Pulitzer Prize winning investigative reporter whose work grapples with the human cost of war. Uh, she's currently working on a book from her deep reporting on America's bombing campaigns. Uh, one of the reasons I'm excited uh, to have her here is, you know, if you read a little bit about her reporting, uh, one of the descriptions was, quote, her investigations have exposed major myths of war. Uh, and that's kind of the crux of what we're trying to get at here. Uh, also honored to be joined by Phil Clay, a novelist and veteran of the United States Marine Corps, his first book, Redeployment. Uh, received the 2014 National Book Award for Fiction. Um, it's the one book I still recommend and hand out to people is kind of the work that captures what it felt like uh, to be deployed at the height of our wars uh, in 2005, 2008 timeframe. Uh, you know, I think he really got a tactile feel for it. Um, it's a beautifully written book, so I can't recommend it enough. Uh, and he followed Redeployment with Missionaries, a book that also ties into today's discussion because it highlights kind of the unintended consequences of exporting military capabilities around the world. Uh, I don't know if that's an accurate description, uh, and Phil might have a different meaning for that, but uh, we'll discuss. Um, lastly, I'm very excited to have Adrian Bonnenberger with us. Uh, Adrian is a former Army officer. He deployed twice to Afghanistan with 173rd and the 10th Mountain, near and dear to my heart. Um, and following his time in the Army, he spent quite a bit of time uh, in Ukraine, uh, living there, working and writing on it, and then returned again after the 2022 20, invasion to help train Ukrainian forces and is currently writing a book about that experience. So, um, you know, the big question here is how do you kick off a discussion about narratives of war and military service? Um, so I went directly to the source, uh, which is the recruiting arm of the United States Marine Corps. Could we roll that first tape, please? Smart. 
the best thing about that video was Osmond leaned over and said, is that real? <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah, and let me tell you, um, yeah, so it's all right there, right? It's the gamification of war and violence. It's the sanitized, it's black and white, right? It's the purity of the knight in shining armor, a heavy dose of at least perceived tradition and chivalry. Uh, so really, Phil, you know, how did this commercial inspire you to join? You know, again, I Which joined, I joined because of the fire monster. Okay? Oh, much better. you know we had. Do you the know fire the fire monster, monster ad? We well, had the fire monster. Yeah. Only to right. be found in an unfortunately an exceptionally low death. Uh, <laughs> that one was slightly different because it was more like the uh, those obstacle course games. But at the end, you get to kill the fire monster. Yeah, you run over a pit of lava and you kill a fire monster, right. which you actually have to do in marine training. <laughs> My monster was named Earl. <laughs> um, so, yeah, yeah, so tell us, I mean, in terms of, right, so that's the point of entry, right? That's the perception. That is how we sell military service. Um, how do you think, is a one, how did it shape you? Uh, how do you think it shapes, you know, the Marine Corps writ large? Um, you know, and what's, what was your journey knowing that you were watching the fire monster and then you said you're going to serve yourself? But, you know, I don't think that sells. I mean, that ad sucks. But <laughs> I don't think that I, if anybody joined the military, <laughs> thinking back on some of the Marines, there are totally some people who probably would have joined the military because of that. But uh, I think, like, a movie like Full Metal Jacket yeah. definitely would have sent far more people into the military uh, I mean, like, Marines love that movie, right? Which sort of, which always disturbs, like, literary critics and mm -hmm. movie reviewers. When they're like, well, that's an anti-war movie. It's like, no, it's not. You just think it is. Um, the, so I think that there's, <laughs> there's a whole kind of, like, weird cultural mess of ideas around war. And that are attractive to people for different reasons. And some of them are the like weirdly sanitized um, things like that. And others, people want to join the military because they want to be close to the heart of darkness, right? Um, and that's a deep appeal as well for human beings. I always think of uh, Thiel de Chardin, the uh, French Jesuit priest and important anthropologist uh, served in World War One, and he wrote an essay in 1917 uh, called Nostalgia of the Front, where he talks about leaving the front and how he, when he's at the front, he wants to leave, right? Because, you know, pain and death are unpleasant. Um, and at that point, he'd been through years, battles. Uh, but as soon as he leaves the front, he wants to go back. And he's like, why? Why do I want to go back to this, like, site of cataclysm and destruction, you know? And he talks about like the human desire for exploration and extremity and all of these things that absolutely captivate us about um, just, I mean, extremes of human experience in general, right? He talks about rear echelon motherfuckers on a different uh, register, um, people like me, pogues. And, uh, and he's like, you know, they live only a few miles from the front, but they might as well be in book too. Like, Obviously, these people don't have a lust for travel, but can we even call them human beings? And so how much of this changed based on, would you have written this book prior to your deployment um, to Iraq? I mean, if you were to so say, somebody said, hey, write a book called Redeployment, pre -de pre your deployment, before you'd gone and seen, um, how different would it have been? How much did the experience kind of more shape that versus yeah, what you could have brought? It, right, I mean, Redeployment was built, was was, written out of the sense of coming back, and again, I was a staff officer, right? Um, you know, I didn't have an intense deployment or anything like that, um, but coming back from a war zone and thinking like, what the hell was that? Mm -hmm. And what is this country? Because the country looks very different, right? Um, to you when you come back from, from a war zone and you, know, you, you went there with not just a sense of what the war meant, but also this sense of, of why you were being sent, mm -hmm. right? What the relationship between you and the citizen was. And that feels like you know, when you come back, you feel like that needs to be renegotiated. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I didn't understand exactly. You know, like y you come back and people think that you might be able to pontificate about war, but you only ever see a little tiny piece of it. And um, 
And so, you know, when I write, it's not because I know something that I want to impart to somebody uh, necessarily. It's more like I, I don't understand something. I'm troubled by something. I'm mm -hmm. entranced by something. And I want to explore that feeling. I want to work it out. All right. Um, also rage sometimes, you know? Rage writing. It's a joke nice. that like every op-ed I ever wrote, <laughs> the working title was fuck all you fucking fuckers, <laughs> including myself. It's a good so, title, actually. Yeah. I should use it someday. So the, uh, on that note, we have a, you know, Adrian's got a slightly different journey, right? I mean, you started out protesting, right? You started out on the other side saying this is all, you know, not the way to go. Uh, and then you end up joining the army. It seemed like kind of an inverted, you know, hero's journey, what we traditionally see. Uh, how'd that happen? So I, the first book, uh, the, one of the very first books that I read was the Golden Pastoral version of the Iliad and the Odyssey, which is a kind of picture book of the Iliad and the Odyssey. Um, and so uh, war has always been a part of my lexicon. One of the reasons I was protesting, one of the many reasons I was protesting against uh, invading Iraq in 2003 was that it seemed like a bad war. Uh, so I had, in, you know, in my family's memory, I think probably many, many people do, especially many people who joined the military, uh, grandfathers who served in World War II. And then my father and almost all of his friends had avoided, scrupulously avoided Vietnam. Um, and that was seen in movies like Full Metal Jacket um, and, and other movies of the time as a bad <clears throat> war. I think we, were, we tend to remember that as a, a war we, we shouldn't have fought or, or if we were going to fight it, not in the ways that we did, such as you know, essentially condoning ethnic cleansing of villages and large populations of Vietnamese. And there are friends now. I mean, the, 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 the craziest coda of all to the war in Vietnam is that now they're allies of ours again because it turns out that they hated the Chinese more than anybody. And they were never actually going to go into the Chinese sphere. Um, so that looked to me, uh, based on the news and based on everything that I saw in reporting and probably my friend network at Yale, uh, like a bad war. And uh, I think one of the things we're learning, and I'm sure we'll get into this conversation a little bit later, um, as, as the talk goes on, is, you know, uh, GWAT, the Global Wars on Terror, like bad wars with bad outcomes. I don't think, I still don't think in my mind actually now that there's any such thing as a good war. Like, I don't think World War II was a good war, but there are sometimes things as necessary wars. Mm -hmm. And because we live in a utilitarian society, and the greatest good for the greatest number of people, which is kind of an approximation of necessity, is seen as good. There's this kind of like philosophical sleight of hand that goes on there. Um, we say World War II is good, and I you know, feel that Ukraine's war of self-defense is a good one, not just because my wife is Ukrainian and uh, her family and, and she are sort of implicated in it and would certainly be gladly killed by the Russians if the Russians had a chance. Um, but because it is a war of self-defense by one country, a smaller country, against a larger country, it is still not a good war. It is a necessary war. And when I was over there, um, you know, both as a reporter uh, for some moments, uh, 2016, 2017, at the zero line, a place where there is no law, there is no order. You know, this is like I, I accessed that moment. And as an infantry officer in the 173rd, several times, you know, where, where nobody could help me. I was calling for help on the radio over TACSAT, you know, for CCA and CAS, XCAS. Uh, but it was really me and the soldiers and our training. And what was happening there was the Taliban and how they were moving and us and how we were moving. And, and the law that each one of us carried was absolute and inherent to our, our weapons and our ammunition. That, I think, is that kind of freedom that people look back on when they come back to the rear and they have to salute again. You know, if, if, if one of my majors or, or uh, one of the majors on staff or the, uh, my, one of my commanders had said, you know, Adrian, you need to do this now or you need to do that now, they wouldn't have known. I mean, they, I would have, I would have dis disobeyed their, their orders sort of naturally, not, not because I wanted to, but because I was doing what needed to be done in the moment. Um, and uh, I, I realize I'm rambling a little bit here, so I'll, I'll stop rambling. That, um, War is bad, and sometimes it's necessary. And those things about it that are most liberating at the point of contact uh, are also you know, really awful when you redeploy and you have to think about them and live with the consequences of them. 
Doesn't follow through. A little bit more on that categorization, right? You've talked about Iraq, bad. Ukraine, necessary. How, in between those two, right, beyond the tactical experience of Afghanistan, how are you processing that now, and where do you place it on that spectrum from necessary to bad? I'm, I'm, I'm terrified of getting in trouble here, but I will be, I'll take a, <laughs> a risk and be honest with you and anybody else who's watching, which is that um, I, th I think it was on a certain level necessary that the United States went into Afghanistan. I think it was necessary. It was not necessary that we stay there. It was not necessary that the type of help we gave was military repurposed as police. Uh, I, I don't think it was, I think, I, my, 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 my take on things, you know, for whatever it's worth, you're paying me nothing, so that's what it's worth, <laughs> is that. They the, gave you beer and, and like I haven't had a beer dogs. yet, I have, but I did get the hot dog and the mustard. Um, <laughs> Love those. <laughs> Hands down, the best, uh, the best snack. I think uh, the State Department was OK with the Department of Defense assuming uh, political liability for Afghanistan. And I think people like me and people of higher ranks were OK doing a battalion or a company or a brigade command and punching their ticket uh, and thinking to themselves, rationalizing it, that they were going to do as well as they could by their soldiers, which is what I did. You know, and, and nobody could do it better than them. But that's, I think, why we stayed and we shouldn't have stayed. It was not necessary for us to stay. It was necessary for us to go in. I can't see a, a world where we don't go into Afghanistan. And 95%, you know, I, like, as soon as we got bin Laden, we absolutely should have gotten out of there and found a way to support the Afghans in a way that was sustainable for them. Um, not doing the patrolling for them, not, not, not telling them how to do it or what to do or where to go, but saying, how do you want to do this? I, I, I personally, I think, you know, this is one of the reasons that Afghanistan turned out the way it did and Ukraine has turned out the way it did. People have been very unfair to the Afghans and say that the Afghans aren't good fighters or they had no sort of national sensibility. And it's, it's completely, anybody who's patrolled with the Afghans know that they're some of the bravest fighters in the world, uh, maybe braver than the Ukrainians even. Um, not stoic, but brave, very brave. I saw this with my own two eyes on numerous occasions. And you know, a lot of them fought and died for a cause that ultimately enough of Afghanistan felt wasn't necessary to do. It said they looked at the Taliban and they looked at the government, they looked at what America had been doing and said, look, you know, if we're going to give 15% of our crop or whatever to the Taliban instead of the government, you know, at least the Taliban isn't going to do this. Or there's there's a little enough distinction that I, I I can I can I I can deal with this. Whereas with the Ukrainians, you know, there are tens of thousands of people on lists. Uh, we see we've seen Buka, we've seen uh, Irpin. The, the the Russians are on a program to denazify Nazia is Russian for nation. They want to make Ukraine not a nation, get rid of the Ukrainian people, get people, get rid of people who speak Ukrainian and destroy that. I mean, you, you can fight or you can leave or you can die. You know, those are your options. So following that thread, go ahead, Phil. I don't want to step on you, but I want to say one other thing about that because you talked about the necessity of, you know, like there, there are occasions and I suppose I should <clears throat> stupidly bring up Israel right now. There are occasions where a nation feels that there is an intense and urgent necessity of military action, right? And then there's the leadership that you have that can take that political will and, and urgency. And the question is, is that leadership competent? Does it have foresight? And is it moral? And um, I think oftentimes when people You'll see this now with the current conflict where people think they have to respond to this attack. And it's very, you can absolutely understand why um, for an Israeli to say there is a genocidal regime that is only using ceasefires to amass firepower. And if we ever slip up, massacres happen. We have to respond. And in the abstract, that makes a lot of sense. And then there's the question of does the current Netanyahu government deserve our faith and their competence, their foresight, and their morality, their, do they have basic respect for the human lives that are going to be at risk? And that's a, those are very different questions. 
back as well to. And I think that that was an issue right. at the beginning of the global war on terror as well. And if we could take that down even further, right? So we've talked, you know, both of you have had kind of that firsthand experience. You've seen it from the military side. I mean, one of the laments of, you know, the last 20 years is that, you know, the military is at war and we have a, an indifferent public. Uh, but clearly there are those who have said, well, wait a minute, you know, what are we signing up for? Uh, and credit to Osmot and crew for, you know, taking that role of citizenship on. Um, and to what you were saying, Phil, or to what Phil was saying, Osmot, there's a, you know, it's not just, hey, we're looking at our senior leaders, but what are these mechanisms that we're trusting with physical violence, right? What are the, who are these leaders that were saying, yes, you are allowed to kill people on behalf of the American citizenry? Uh, and one, have they earned the trust? Do they keep it? Um, you were watching this from the outside, and you said, wait a minute, I got questions. And you question the one institution that most people in America don't want to question, because it's kind of our last, it's our knight in shining armor, right? Why would you question anything the military does? Uh, but you did. Why? Well, I think this comes back to sort of, you know, how did I get into journalism? How did I start looking at all of this? Um, I was in high school when 9-11 happened, and still in high school when the Iraq War started, and was reading, consuming journalism of all different kinds. And the place where I got my journalistic education largely was the PBS series Frontline. And I'll probably reference many Frontlines. Um, <laughs> but one I'd encourage you to watch if you haven't yet is like a seven-part series called News War. Um, and it looks at the period before the Iraq War, one of the sections, one of these seven parts. <laughs> Uh, looks at the journalism in the lead up to that war. And I think it's a great examination of so many of the reasons of why I ultimately became a journalist was watching not just what the American people were told from officials, but also the failures in journalism in the lead up to that war. Uh, the, the kind of competition for scoops and the reliance on anonymous sources and this shift towards greater secrecy and just this desire for transparency and truth. And a writer who, whose work influenced me deeply, and I think about how the world would be different if he were still alive, was Anthony Shadid, um, the extraordinary journalist uh, whose reporting from Iraq gave such a vastly different perspective of what we were, you know, what you would see sometimes on nightly news or embeds or particular lenses into the war that we had and just introduced you to ordinary Iraqi civilians and what they encountered. And there was something, there was something very clear about what was missing. Uh, and for me as a journalist, you know, investigative journalism is what I aspire to most. Like I'm not in this for, I'm not, <laughs> I don't do this for partisan reasons. This is not about opinions. It's about systematically looking into something in its totality, trying to understand structures, trying to answer some of these questions. And I think that that's an avenue to look at investigative journalism specifically. It was an avenue for me to really test the claims. Um, and so for me, it just became, it became an understanding. You know, growing up, reading all of that, seeing some of those distinctions, seeing some of those failures, and knowing that there is a specific kind of journalism that allows you to test those, to go on the ground, to do that kind of long, hard work. And it, yeah, it was just, it, it, I feel most myself when I do it, if that makes any sense. It's kind of the, it's the, uh, that tension, right, between propaganda and truth. And at what point do you lose that connection with the truth and start believing your own propaganda, right? How do you keep nations moored? If we could, could you play that second uh, video clip, please? <clears throat> A Taliban rival calling itself ISIS-K claimed responsibility for the attack. The U.S. responded by striking a parked car in Kabul with a drone. It turned out that 10 innocent Afghan civilians were killed. At least one of those people killed was an ISIS facilitator. So, were there others killed? Yes, there are others killed. Who they are, we don't know. We'll try to sort through all that. And I don't want to influence the outcome of an investigation, but at this point, we think that the procedures were correctly followed and it was a righteous strike. 
The target, a white sedan that had been under US military surveillance for the past eight hours. It had just driven into the residential compound with father of seven and NGO worker Zamarai Amadi behind the wheel. The strike didn't just kill the father. Seven children were also dead. The Pentagon's investigation revealed that no ISIS militants were at the scene. Most Americans saw that, right? That was the Abigate bombing. Uh, 13 Marines killed, I think, 120 plus Afghans dead. Um, that visceral reaction, right? We've got to get somebody. Somebody has to pay for this death. Um, most Americans saw that. They saw that clip. They saw General Milley make that statement. And they gave him the benefit of the doubt. Uh, because what he was saying is what we've heard a lot from the military. Uh, every time one of these happens, there's a great uh, line that you describe some of this as. It's always characterized as unfortunate, unavoidable, and uncommon. But yet, you were ready to point something out. Can you tell us why that was anything but uncommon and what it took for you to have the kind of the the grounding of truth to be able to um, do something that no one else really wanted to do. Um, I mean, in some ways, this was uncommon in the sense that it was probably the most watched strike in the world. Uh, it occurred in an urban center, whereas most of these occur in places, in Afghanistan at least, in rural areas that are incredibly hard to access, where there is no CCTV camera footage from an NGO or let alone mobile lines. Mobile lines in most of the areas where I've done reporting in Afghanistan on airstrikes and civilian casualties were places where I did not have cell access, um, let alone internet, let alone you know, places where there is footage. Um, so in some ways, this was an anomaly. The whole world was watching, and the government was forced to respond, and these lies fell apart part, or not even lies necessarily, I think people genuinely believed what they were saying when they said this was a righteous strike. Um, and later on, I got the document into their own investigation into this incident, and Abby Gate played a huge role in why they were looking for um, this car. And I think people legitimately, it's confirmation bias, but for me, like one incident is never enough to tell you anything. You, you know, the MSF hospital attack, major event, everyone was watching in Kunduz in 2015, not enough, like you do need to look at things systematically. And so after the Kabul strike, when people were really struck by, you know, there were no findings of wrongdoing or disciplinary action for anyone involved. Again, one incident can't tell you about those, the totality of this, you need to look at a sizable sample. And so, uh, you know, I'd done a lot of coverage of civilian casualties and drone strikes and things uh, before this, but it was really in 2016 when I was looking at these statistics and counting, you know, our government says we investigate, we assess all claims of civilian casualties, and we're gonna publish the results of those in the war against ISIS. And I knew that at that stage, they'd admitted to 21 civilian deaths. And at the same time, they were claiming to have killed 25,000 ISIS fighters. And it was being published in the front pages of newspapers with no attribution even to the military, just presented as fact. And those two things, if you know anything about warfare, it's next to impossible that you could have those kinds of statistics. And yes, we had greater technology, but the question becomes like, can I test this on the ground? Can I do a sizable sample? And so for me, it became like, can I get access to areas? Can I be on the ground? Can I do interviews? Can I try to verify those? Can I get an embed at the Combined Air Operations Center in, in Qatar? Can I interview people who do this, these strikes and how it works. And it just became, can I get to a sizable enough sample? And originally, <laughs> I was content to do um, around 50 strikes. And uh, I was working with a sociologist who was like, you need to get to something that's statistically significant. It's very annoying. His name is Anand Gopal. And uh, <laughs> it's like, you need to get to over 100, and it'll be statistically significant, and we can do an inference. <laughs> so I did. I got to over 100. Um, for a, for a story called The Uncounted, and just to give you a sort of breakdown of what it worked out to. If you analyze the government's press releases, you know, um, at the time of publication, and one out of every 157 airstrikes had resulted in a civilian death in Iraq, according to the press releases. From our sample on the ground, um, one in five did. That's not two, three, four times higher 
was 31 times higher. And I know that our numbers were an undercount. I wasn't counting the children of ISIS families, even though I'd like heard about them, learned about them, knew they existed. They didn't meet the levels of verification that I wanted. I knew I was undercounting civilian deaths. And so for me, that was evidence of, well, we, I need to do more of this. But also, I wanted more of the, you know, again, this goes back to secrecy and transparency. And I know so many incredible, I've had, I don't talk about them as much, but I have so many incredible military sources and people who've helped me understand documents and processes and all of this. And, um, you know, they'll tell me as well, like, this stuff shouldn't be secret. This should be public. The, the public should have a right to know about this. And, and for me, a big problem was, is I can do all the work I can on the ground, but the government can say, or you know, a senior official can say, well, you don't have access to the intelligence that we do. You may have done whatever your little work was on the ground, but we have superior information you don't have. And so that became the next front for me. Like, I might know that it's one in five, but to truly understand why, I need your own assessments. I need what you thought you were targeting. I need the details of the evidence you had and I want to compare it on the ground. And that became the next sort of bar to reach um, and resulted in the civilian casualty files, those like 1,300 of their own assessments um, that I sued to get under the Freedom of Information Act. And then as many of them as I could test on the ground um, became my goal. And how often had um, Americans attempted to talk to people on the ground and not just assess it through drone footage? I know a lot of journalists who do want to do that work. And they'll yeah, often tell the story of one, oh, <laughs> none. Um, so of the 1,300 assessments in the, that, that I obtained for the civilian casualty files, um, I've, I've gotten more since. Of those 1,300, in only two instances, did they ever visit the site of an airstrike to investigate on the ground? That was Mosul Jadida, a mass civilian casualty incident in Mosul. And only in one other did they ever interview survivors. And this was not one where they went, to, you know, they heard about an incident. They interviewed. It was one where they went to a refugee camp after people had fled in ISIS-held territory. Um, and they arrived there, and they went to go interview them for intelligence about what should we be striking in this territory you just took. And people brought up, well, there was this one civilian casualty incident in this one place, and it became the subject of one of these files. But no, they were not doing any of that. And you might argue. And <laughs> Some have argued this, that, well, it's really risky. We can't do that work on the ground. If I could do it as a freelancer, as an ordinary person, with few resources and protections, uh, you know, a military certainly can, and their partner forces certainly can. I, I, don't buy, I do not buy that argument. Uh, it's not based in fact, based on my own reporting experiences. Um, but no, I mean, they should have been doing that work. I, you know, it's my job as a journalist to do it, but... Um, I think it goes against our, you know, it's our narrative, right? If I can look at a digital output and say, I've done right, and ultimately no one's held responsible for setting up the procedures by which this continues to happen, right? It's the, uh, it allows that false narrative, right? That tension between truth and propaganda, uh, and we can keep along that. Um, but it's not just in bombing, right? Phil, you discuss, right, some of the capabilities, uh, advising efforts play out in unintended ways, right? We, we see we're just, you know, drones are a force for good because we can bomb evil people around the world and, you know, we don't need to look at the error term because it doesn't exist because we're that good. You looked at, in missionaries, you know, this example of Columbia where we're basically exporting uh, advisory and special forces capabilities and the ability supposedly to target folks, to take out bad guys. Yeah. What did you discover as part of that process about perceptions of the U.S. military, about perceptions and unintended consequences? Sure. So, you know, one of the things that I really admire about your work is, um, so I talk as a writer, there's a, there's a Raymond Chandler essay called The Simple Art of Murder, um, where he talks about like different types of murder mysteries, and one of them is like the architect who's interested in like setting up complex systems, and and, and another person who's interested in character, right? And and you know he's firm in the character camp, and he says like those two don't often intersect, right? And it's very difficult to be the sort of person who can get a grasp on a system, because a lot of times there's individual wrongdoing, but what was more concerning to me 
with systems that are in place where everybody thinks they're doing the right thing and it results in tragedy. And you know, your work looks at the system, takes apart the, the sort of flaws built into the system that generate bad outcomes, but then also in the actual articles, you have to make that real. You have to make that individual people. One, you know, we're talking about n narratives. One of the very popular narratives of, you know, if you look at TV shows or whatever, it's like, you know, the Navy SEAL who goes in and, um, uh, you know, takes out a bad guy, right? And it's a very simple story with a beginning, middle, and end, which, you know, is narratively satisfying, also kind of like the least appropriate type of narrative to tell about the global war on terror. And, uh, yeah, so that's the reason why in, in, in Missionary is the center of the book involves a raid, based on a real raid that happened where there was like a Colombian drug lord uh, who was special ordering a six foot tall teddy bear for his girlfriend, as you do for her birthday party. If you've never done that, you clearly have less love in your heart <laughs> than a drug lord. And um, they put a tracker in the teddy bear and you know followed it to the birthday party uh, and killed him. It was a surprise party. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that was, yeah, uh, uh, anyway, um, and so one way of telling that story is like there's a bad guy and they took him out, in this case it's the Colombian military with U.S. support, uh, and we've been supporting the Colombians and doing this sort of thing, and then like, okay, now we go away, but in that particular region, the question is, well, what happens afterwards? Like, to me, the main lesson that we should have learned from the global war on terror is that <laughs> it is the second and third order consequences of violence that often are the most important, right? And if you can close off the narrative artificially, you can tell a story in which you're doing a good thing, right? You got a bad guy. You got a bad guy and maybe there were some civilian casualties, right? Um, and the civilian casualties, if there are civilian casualties, it's really the bad guy's fault because they hide amongst the civilians, right? But we don't need to worry about that. We don't need to be too morally troubled by that. And then if you look at the broader campaign and you start asking questions about whether what we're doing makes any kind of long-term strategic sense, whether it is sort of, you know, those are the kind of questions I was interested in. So, you know, for me, it was like, I'm gonna tell a narrative where that happens in the beginning and what happens when we take that person out in a good strike, it was important to me that it was a strike where we were actually hitting the target that was intended, and nevertheless, okay, it opens a power vacuum in that region. And we don't understand that region because the people who are calling the shots and who want to do that, they don't really understand the local, political, military, cultural context, which is extremely complicated. Um, and so they're not anticipating how things will play out and, and how things will spiral. And that was, you know, and it's very concerning to me because it seems like we've created a lot of these sort of like systems <laughs> um, that if you look at them very narrowly seem like they make sense and they seem very effective and they can even seem very clean and humane, right? Um, and then the question is, okay, but what are the consequences of them? to that really quickly because there's a nuance to that scene. I've read Missionaries. I can't recommend it highly enough. It's a wonderful book. Um, but the nuance is that, and I believe I've got, I believe this is the correct strike. The special operations, the U.S. special operations liaison is there, and he's watching the Colombian special forces carry out this raid. And in his mind, at first, he's, he, he realizes that they're doing it as well or perhaps better than US special operations. And then he catches himself and he says, actually, he thinks to himself, no, it's a little bit worse. And he sort of overcounts them carrying out this raid because, of course, you know, US special operations is the gold standard. But I, I really appreciated that nuance because they're even within the system, it feels sometimes, it felt certainly in Afghanistan, like the books were being cooked and there was, if not, a, a racial element. I, d I don't want to put that, I, 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 I can't even characterize it as, as that necessarily, but at least some sort of um, a kind of arrogance on our part and saying this is how you ought to do it. And then always making sure that the it that is being done is not quite as good. 
Um, and one of the things that was so satisfying to me about um, my experience uh, with a mutual friend of ours, Matt, mutual friends of ours, Matt Gallagher and Ben Bush in Ukraine, was seeing how quickly people took to what we were teaching them, which is this awful kind of chimerical hybrid of Ranger Handbook and Marine Corps training that Ben Bush knew, and, and, and neither Matt and I could make heads or tails of, of course. Um, but seeing that, I realized that all of that time I'd spent in Afghanistan, I spent far more time training Afghan soldiers and police than I ever did training Ukrainians. Um, there was some kind of miscommunication that had been uh, hardwired into it. And that's not systemic. That's actually personal. Mm -hmm. That's some kind of uh, uh, awful miscommunication that doesn't just happen in Afghanistan. It happens in Colombia and everywhere else. I thought that was a very true moment in your book that, that really underlined, the, to me, um, the flaw in the machine, which isn't the system. It's how the, the system is applied by people maybe not fully acting in good faith. Thing, yeah, that, that, that's, that is the one bit of that book that stuck out because I think it was the most true. It was like, of course, he's counting the seconds uh, to show that, you know, these guys aren't as good as the Americans. Like, of course, he's doing that. Um, but it's the, you know, it's the, but he still felt like, again, to your point, he's doing something pure and good, uh, but he's doing it in isolation of the, the politics and the reality. And I guess, you know, how many... And when you were talking to folks on the ground, as how many times, in your estimate, how many times do we get the benefit of the doubt? How, how sustainable is it? Right? Because we probably would have said it's sustainable at one out of 300, right? We accidentally killed a civilian one out of 300 times. Hey, we're super sorry about that. Is it sustainable at one out of five? So it's, it's, it's hard to say, and I think it's different in different conflicts. So in Afghanistan, um, what I found was that the civilian casualties there were huge drivers of support for the Taliban, um, significantly so. In Iraq, it was a little trickier, and the breakdowns for me came down to, uh, it wound up being mass casualty incidents. Um, mass casualty incidents were driver, it came down to like how they felt. <laughs> Their perception of the United States, like that's, that's a, um, like a, that, that's a ship that sailed, right? It's really more about like their perception of their own government, which you know we'd like to fund, et cetera. So how, you know how much faith? That's sort of the question you have to ask: is is this driving them, you know, to support their own government, or is it driving them to support, you know, or to turn to? And I would say that before, you know, one of the reasons that ISIS took hold was that there was a lot of distrust of the Iraqi government in many of these areas where ISIS gained ground um, in Iraq, at least. And it's different in Syria, but I can. But let's just focus on Iraq for a second. What I found was that um, because these people were also subject to incredible abuses by ISIS as well. So they were like making choices. And what I found was that these mass casualty incidents, which happened in areas of liberation, they would be, you know, entire families would gather in a single building together, you know, extended families, you know how this, this many members of the single family would could, could, they could count to like 100 people huddled together that gets bombed, it's, you know, whether it's an intelligence error or something else, um, you know, and I've written as extensively about what the causes were in the incidents I investigated, but um, in those situations, yeah, it turned them against the government. People felt abandoned, they felt like it was intentional. People would tell me that, no, the Iraqi forces are targeting us on purpose. They want revenge because uh, we fell to ISIS, and they think we're all ISIS now. And this was just meant to be a campaign where we were encircled, West Mosul in particular. We were encircled. This was the last stand. There was no exit corridor for ISIS fighters. The battle was not supposed to leave Mosul and go elsewhere with those fighters. It was meant to be solved here, and we, were, we paid the price. We paid the price of ridding this area from ISIS, and there's an incredible resentment. And I would say that um, that is what groups harness and use groups like ISIS. It doesn't have to be ISIS, but that kind of discontent is what organizations um, can manipulate and use, and that is a real danger. So not to be aware of that is a profound problem. And I'll just say it's um, it's important on that level, this level of counterterrorism and um, safety and security. But I think the thing that we share in common and why I'm such an admirer of both of yours work is that there, it's about truth, right? It's about being informed, and for me as a journalist, that's about informing the public. Can we really have a real conversation about a war if we don't know the true human cost? 
I'm not saying it's good or bad. I'm saying, can you, as a democratic society, have that conversation? And you know, you've written extensively about this, but I have found so many um, moral arguments and what you're what you're presenting that are very similar. But um, can we ask someone to push the button and make a decision if we don't truly know, if we're not investigating on the ground? Can you ask somebody to lethally target someone? And this is something he's written about so well, but. Um, you know, it's a moral question, it's a, demo a question of democracy, and then it's a question of, you know, what you raise, safety and security, right? Uh, what are the effects of those cycles of violence? So it's, it's interesting, so everybody, right, we're talking about truth, learned experience, connecting with humanity in all the various messy ways that it happens. Uh, but now we have two conflicts that we get to judge and cheer or jeer from afar, right? We're watching from distance. Um, has that helped the conversation or hurt it? It's, it, it has changed it, I think, firstly, because for the first time in my lifetime, I've seen a necessary war, as I, I tried to lay that framework out earlier. Not a good war, again. I don't think there's any such thing. Um, when I left uh, Ukraine in May, uh, right before the counteroffensive began, the now probably failed counteroffensive, uh, I trained, finished training about 300 reconnaissance soldiers, many of whom were in their 30s and 40s, and they were not, you know, people of high morale. These were not people who were excited to go on the counteroffensive, and that blew my mind a little bit. Because before every mission, you know, we went out on in Afghanistan. You know, me and the soldiers and the sergeants and the officers would get hyped up. You know, people would be listening to music that would kind of energize them. And, and we might not have been, you know, super excited to be there, but I, I did everything I could as a commander to really explain not just to my unit, but also to the Afghans that I was partnered with why we were there, what we were doing, and what we hoped to achieve. And also to the Taliban as well. On my second deployment when I was a commander, a bunch of Taliban units switched sides to the government. They became anti, you know, they became pro-government militias from anti-government militias. And the Ukrainians were people who were there because they didn't want their sons to be in the military because a letter had come and they had answered it. And this is, you know, this is 2023 here, so the first wave has passed. But they were all going, you know. That's difficult to kind of wrap your head around. People who were basically, when I, first got there, people were going to Bakhmut. And when I left, they were going to Zaporizhia for the counteroffensive. And you know what's changed? That a necessary war, you know? That's like, I, I hope everybody sits with that a little bit. I, I also hope to God that we never face a necessary war. I've seen it in the place, um, and it doesn't look very appealing. Uh, it's, it's not something that one would ever hope for. Um, I think that's, I can tell you that's changed for me because I went from protesting the war in Iraq to being in Afghanistan, seeing a ton of, uh, if, if not like actual legal fraud, waste, and abuse, institutional fraud, waste, and abuse, people going on, you know, distinguished visitor tours, blowing $100,000 worth of fuel as Blackhawks did battlefield cirques for no clear purpose. You know, I think we spent something like $50 billion renting a bunch of, you know, up-armored, uh, you know, the MRAPs and the MATVs for like five years. Like we had those for five years, 2009 or so, to 2008 to 2012. And then they all went off to police uh, organizations or in some cases... Afghan formations that couldn't keep them up without contractor help. Um, so $50 billion, you know, for that. And, and now I'm looking at things, and, you know, last year we were trying to turn, you know, we were trying to turn the factories on to produce, you know, 90,000 rounds of howitzer ammunition, 155 millimeter HEDP. We, we wanted to, we had to go for, we started off producing 14,400, and President Biden said, you know, by the end of the year it's going to be 90,000. And then very quietly, near the end of the year, he said, it's going to take us a few years to get there. And so, like, we're, for, for better and for worse, for better in the sense of Asmat's reporting and getting a true sense of war and the cost of war and our, like, really, like, 
nearly criminally negligent way of employing violence in other places. We've gone from that to the point where if we had to fight a war of necessity, we could not beg, borrow, or steal a million rounds of 155 HEDP howitzer ammunition per year. We just couldn't do it. We don't have the gunpowder to do it. We don't have the manufacturing capacity. That's a little nutty for me. So I, I mean, I, one of the reasons I was interested in doing this event is to help me. I'm thinking through a lot of these things now. Um, you know, I don't want a necessary war, but I do want the country to be able to win a necessary war. I also don't know, seeing what we did in Iraq and Afghanistan, if you know, political leadership should ever be entrusted with the means to win a necessary war because we seem to misuse it so, so casually. Um, but you know, certainly the Ukrainians wish that they hadn't given away their nuclear weapons. They're all, every last one of them, kicking themselves over that. So. Just this question of do, looking at things from a distance. You know, there's sometimes there are times when you don't have the option of going. Like it's not po physically possible, and there are moments in which I think that's all you have. But I, I really lament the loss of in, in journalism, in particular, of of people being there on the ground. Um, I think that oh, I've been so. In Ukraine, like I've just been so impressed by the reporting on civilian casualties because there are journalists on the ground, Ukrainian journalists, foreign journalists. They're doing extraordinary work. There also isn't like a ban on social media and, and things. Like, we're getting information out about this. And there are people who, from a distance, are able to use new technologies and tools to do reporting. But it's complemented by extraordinary ground reporting. And I think one of the greatest examples of this is the Times reporting from Bucha, um, which was a combination of reporters on the ground and the visual investigations team and the, the kind of integrating those things. It's extraordinary work. In this war right now in, in Israel, I, you know, I, I've been so gripped and appreciative to Israeli journalists who've been covering the attacks, um, the Hamas attack on October 7th. Uh, their presence, their ability to document horrific casualties is so important, and at the same time, I know what we're losing because journalists like myself don't have access to Gaza. I know what we are not getting, and I also know, you know, what what others can talk about is that uh, Gazan journalists are paying a price we haven't seen for journalists in in years. Um, uh, in total, I think it's 31 journalists have died in this war so far. Uh, of them, I think four are Israeli, 26 are Palestinian journalists, one is Lebanese. Um, and Gazan journalists are not treated like they're journalists. They're treated like they, and the, that, those numbers, just to give you some perspective, um, in Ukraine, in 21 months, I believe we lost 23 journalists in 21 months. And so in less than a month, we've lost 26 Palestinian journalists. And so these aren't numbers we've seen before. So those journalists are paying a huge price to tell those stories, and we don't have access on the ground. Um, and I think that there's a lot that we, that we lose when that kind of accountability reporting can't happen. Um, it's really, you know, I worry about truth and accountability in war and our ability to effectively weigh in on them and have real debates over them because that's a conversation we can have, right? Yeah. Um, but do you have the right information to have a real conversation? Actually remember, um, you might have been there too. Uh, there was, uh, I think it was 2014, Chris Chivers had just come back from his last trip to Syria. Amazing journalist. Amazing journalist, uh, great writer. And he was up there on stage drinking, I, he, he actually doesn't drink anymore, but everybody else was drinking beers, saying, do not go to Syria. And there were folks like me and John Ismay in the crowd and Matt Gallagher being like, you know, we want to go to Syria. And, not Austin Tice. Austin Tice had actually just been captured, um, and he was. And Chris was like, the, the, "This is I've never been to a place like that before." Mm -hmm. Syria is an example of, and I, I feel awful about my my own personal attitudes towards Syria. I bought every, you know, BS conspiracy theory and, and, and regime propaganda that came out of there. The big difference between Syria and Ukraine is access to journalists. You know, is that Ukraine said, "Come on in, wherever you want to go." You can go, you can check it out, and uh, you're absolutely right. So 
I was one of those people who thought the white hats for some sort of you know, conspiracy. No, they were good people trying to do good things in a really awful situation. Um, so, uh, Phil, last comment before we open the floor. Do you have anything to address on that question? What happens when we're watching from afar? You know, I think it's very hard. There's a, there's a poem by the um, Arab American poet named Philip Metris, which is dedicated to a Gazan poet who's actually, actually in Gaza right now and his house was just destroyed. Um, which is called an, an, an apology for temperate speech. And it's sort of an apology for trying to approach the subject in a measured way. And I think that you feel that right now with this issue where there are people for whom, because the stakes feel existential and because the horror is so intense, um, it is it almost feels like an affront to try and maintain a kind of measured, like, let me sample different points of view comfortably from a distance. Um, and I think that it is essential. It's actually, I, I do think it is actually essential to do that. But I think that it's also essential to do that while allowing yourself to feel the intensity of that pull and the intensity of the horror that people are working through um, that makes it almost impossible to have a conversation between people on different sides. <clears throat> Absolutely. Um, we have time for a few questions, if anyone has a question. The gentleman from NPR. <laughs> I'm going to ask you guys a horribly unfair question, uh, knowing each of your work and admiring it. Uh, my name is Quayle Lawrence with NPR. Um, what gives you hope in your work, and how do you do you try to uh, put hope into your work? It's a great moment for that one, right? Yeah. Good luck. Right. Good. I've met some of my favorite people in the world, or the people I've been the most inspired and moved by through my work. Um, and one of the things I do, like for, you know, you're, I, I have all different kinds of sources, but I, um, okay, there's two things that are giving me hope right now. One are the people on the inside who want to make a difference. And so, you know, I would previously mentioned there are, inc there are incredible military personnel who want to see things be done better or want truths and I just you know that gives me hope every time someone like that comes to me or um, opens up or walks me through something like I am indebted fully indebted that's that's one thing but uh, another thing is just um, sir I spend a lot of time with survivors of war so people who've experienced you know who have to open up about the worst nights of their lives and it's horrible and potentially re-traumatizing. So you do all of these things to try to um, not re-traumatize them when you ask them to talk about these things. And one of them is that, you know, you go into these conversations, but I have to bring them out of them. So I have to ask, you have to transition out. Um, you have to ask them about what they're hopeful about. You have to ask them about how they cope. And I've had some of my favorite conversations in the world through that. You know, people who tell me, they talk to me about their, they tell me about miracles, their belief in the afterlife. Um, they talk about the relationship to God or their, um, you know, just the small textures, the pleasures of daily life. And I think that those things are things that, like, they remain imprinted in my head. And um, oftentimes just hearing how other people cope is just so helpful to me in all different kinds of, you know, all different places of my life. Uh, it's a beautiful thing. That's, that's what I get hope of. This, um this journalist who sometimes write for America Magazine, the Jesuit Magazine, who had a piece about a um, Catholic priest who's during Syria who shepherding a small Catholic community, deep links with the Muslim uh, population in their region, who's ultimately taken by ISIS, and then gets out with the help of, of some of the Muslim neighbors. And she's interviewing him, and he talks about how we're all made in the image of God, and this includes the people who took him. And she says, like, were you able to see that in them even when they were torturing you? And he said, no. Like, in the moment of being tortured, the pain is too intense. You cannot. Um, but afterwards, you can try and come back to that. And um, 
that sense of human beings is made in the image of God. I think that when you're dealing with this work and the horror of it, the horror of it is because human beings really are that valuable, right? I think that there's, um, there's a kind of retreat to cynicism, right, that you see in, in um, you know, if you think about like Celine, one of the great writers, Journey to the End of the Night, right? Like um, uh, where everything almost becomes like this cynical farce and it's not that surprising that he, you know, was a fascist, basically. And I think that the remembering that the horror that you, like the horror is not the reality, the reality is the beauty of what's being destroyed. Yeah, I, I think that's exactly right. I, I feel that I spent time in cynicism. I spent time after I left the military looking for answers and became quite cynical and have been slowly clawing my way out. Okay, but there's some hilarious short stories that came out of that. Well, thank you for saying so. I, I appreciate this that. I'm that for talking about that Navy SEAL story, but it's really good. <laughs> it's not the forum for that, but it is. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, you know, I, I, I think I, I haven't been very hopeful for the past few years, certainly not um, since Russia invaded Ukraine again in 2022, lost a lot of sleep, did what I could to kind of keep myself on an even keel, work out, take walks in the woods with the dog. Um, I've become much more stoic, um, but not cynical. And I, it's, it's changed my relationship with faith, and I've, I've had to become more faithful um, spiritually. Uh, but I cannot say that I'm hopeful about things right now. I feel pretty, uh, pretty down, but not cynical. Because, as you say, you know, people are so important and the whole thing seems so precarious now. Other questions? Okay, we got a few. We'll go uh, back in the back to Dan and then we'll come up front and then hit here in the front. Thanks, everyone. Dan from uh, Morning Common. Just curious how you think, in terms of telling stories of war, evolution of narrative, social media. I don't, obviously, I could be, this is not new, Arab Spring, but I think a lot of us have a model in our mind. Adrian, you let off with the Iliad and the Odyssey. Like we're used to these kind of narrative being shaped by specific content, and I have no idea what's shaping narratives of Gaza and Ukraine on TikTok or on Truth Social or on Rumble, but that certainly is like we're seeing the creation of narrative in a new way. And so I'm just curious how you think that is affecting people's understanding of war. Question. I, I want to jump in here because I have a secret, I have a secret sick TikTok problem. Um, <laughs> I don't put it on my regular phone. It's on my bed phone, which I'm allowed to, I'm allowed to use before I go to bed. Um, I refuse to turn in my old phones when I get a new one. So <laughs> anyway, my, my bed phone. Um, and uh, every night before I go to sleep, my sisters and I, we have a group chat called TikTok O'Clock, and we're <laughs> sending TikToks back and forth. And um, <laughs> you've all lost respect for me, but I'm going somewhere with this, <laughs> which is that um, like, I'm obsessed with the idea of para-journalists. Um, these people who are not the producers of information, they're, sometimes they're on the ground and they are the, the content creators, they're you know, sharing these videos, but these people who come and explain you know, what they're seeing in the world, and I'm increasingly kind of at Columbia, I'm like, we need to do something about the para-journalists and training them, and because media literacy is so important to that space that I think is just being, it's evolving on its own without a lot of the same um, steering or uh, you know, confines of departments and disciplines and uh, methodologies. They're just kind of, I mean, it's, there's a way that it's being worked out, you know, online. Like, it's not like it's uh, not thought out. It's, it's just fascinating to see. But I do worry about uh, those of us who are not invested in some of these spaces and people producing that content and where does your for journalism, I think about it in that context, like what is our responsibility at a journalism school um, to help promote that kind of media literacy and not ignore people who are very increasingly we're going to have to depend on for engagement and distribution models, you know, when you can put anything you want out into the world, but will it reach people? Like those are questions I think we haven't answered. I do see a lot of interesting uh, war-related um, accounts. I will say that 
it is different on TikTok than it is on some of the other platforms that I consume. And in some ways that can be really great and in some ways it can be really dangerous. Right. To, you know, one of the great studies Dan's team has done, you know, for all of us olds in the room, which is basically everybody here. Not me. Right. Now you, you're the only, you're, you're, you're a lifeline. But for those of us who are not, right, you know, the number one source of history, information on history and history learning right now in the United States is YouTube, right? The way young adults get their news, TikTok, right? And that keeps getting shown. And so we can pretend that we're not part of that or that that's a separate thing and that we, you know, we're all reading the Times dutifully and, you know, going through it. But that's where news is coming from. And so I think it's a wonderful question, Dan. Let's go you real quick. Yeah. I got an M of S from Columbia in journalism in 2014 in the Stabile program, the investigative journalism program. They're the best. They're the best. <laughs> I probably the last veteran they'll ever take. I'm sorry I ruined it for the rest of you. <laughs> <laughs> Not true. So, so, um, so you know, it, it's an M of S because journalism is a science, and people are under the misapprehension that you take your phone out, and you go out, and you record a video, and you jump up there, and you say, "This I thought this about it," um, and, and that's journalism. But the, the whole concept of journalism is very similar to a scientific experiment. That's what sources are. That's why it's important not to, whenever you can, not have anonymous sources, because anybody ought to be able to do that experiment the way you did that experiment in ninth grade biology. If I may, I just want to highlight um, one of my former students who is a veteran, Jeff Parrott, is in the room. <laughs> Jeff was in my conflict reporting class in 2019 and worked with me on the civilian casualty files. And I just want to say, you know, somebody who was a, a veteran and deployed to Afghanistan, it was so helpful just in the context of the civilian casualty files. I want to give a shout out to Jeff, who was, you know, one of those people who really helped me understand things. And he's fantastic, I just have to say. And every, and every, <laughs> Professor, I'm sure, was like, thank God you're not like Bonnenberg. Theo and you, ask your question real quick, and then the two, both of you, ask your question, and then we'll move over to the other side of the room real quick. Sure, my name's Theo Lipsky. I'm an Army officer, and uh, the question I have is regarding the role of history in shaping our moral judgments about war, specifically our, what we think is our historical understanding of past wars and it becoming a yardstick for our measurement of current conflicts. Obviously, World War II comes to mind, and you talked about how it's regarded as a good war, and that's complicated and worth debating. But even in, I think, a recent press conference, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu used an instance from wo World War II to explain that Israel's behavior in the conflict was not anything new. And because it was forgiven in other instances, it ought to be forgiven now. I'm a student at Columbia. We read a Paul Fussell reading about reporting from wartime that described just how censored the American audience's understanding of World War II was in the moment, and I'm sure we're all, whether we realize it or not, inheriting those memories that were shaped by that censorship. Does that make us less capable of judging the morality in war because our yardstick is wrong, or does historical understanding make us more con capable of judging the morality in war? Questions, all right, that's, I love that question, but get yours real quick too, and then break. Right. I'm a student at SIPA and a Marine Corps officer. Adrian, this is more of a question for you. As the conflict in Ukraine is so ubiquitous. It seems that the Ukrainian public probably has a very good idea of what combat looks like in Ukraine. Do you find that Ukrainian combat veterans have trouble communicating their experience to Ukrainian civilians? Either of those in either order. Go ahead, Adrian, hit that. I'll take the second one first very quickly, which is uh, it, it, it's been incredible for me to, to see, you know, going uh, from uh, the front or near the front to Kyiv and everything that we talked about coming home from Iraq or Afghanistan or being in the military, it's the same dynamic everywhere. It's kind of like you were saying where, you know, if you're three or four miles behind the zero line, I'm sure the people at the Ukrainians at the zero line talk about the people who are at the one line or the two line, the way that the, uh, it's, it's the same everywhere from that perspective. But, but there is, I think, that the thing that 